Andrew Pugsley. Hello, Pippa Evans. How are you today? I'm very well, actually. How are you? I'm also very well. Uh, welcome to you and everybody listening to this episode of the Showstopper podcast. I'm, I'm particularly excited about recording this episode of the Showstopper podcast. Oh, why is that, Pippa? Because I am a big fan of Fun Home and yeah. we have... One of the stars of Fun Home. Uh, yes, we have Kaiser Hammerland, who is amazing. And we uh, get to talk to her and sing with her, which is incredible. Yeah, she's in Violet at the moment at the Charing Cross, another musical by the amazing Janine Tesori. She's also amazing in that. She's been in Legally Blonde in Swedish. In Sweden and in Swedish. Uh, in Sweden, <laughs> Swedish. In Sweden, Swedish. Uh, and uh, lucky, lucky listeners, there is a bit of Swedish Legally Blonde in the cast, so uh, do listen out for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what, Pippa? What? People, uh, people listen to our podcast. Do they actually listen? They do actually listen. And sometimes they send us little messages uh, on Twitter or other forms of social media. Do you have any of those messages to hand? You know what? I actually do. Here's a, a particularly appropriate one. At Michael Jones says, just caught up with episode four of the Showstoppers podcast. Another excellent episode, not least because they read my tweet out at the start. <laughs> Well, so here we are starting episode five uh, with Michael Jones's latest tweet on the subject. I hope, Michael Jones, you're going to start a feedback loop. Yeah, and we've also got uh, this message here, Joe at Refracted Sound. She says, ooh, feeling super lucky to have seen Tennessee Waltz, uh, one of Andrew Pugsy's favourites in the At The Showstopper's current West End run. It was indeed excellent and worth listening to the latest At The Showstopper's podcast for more backstory. Mm. So we were talking about that in the, the last episode. We did talk about it last episode. I think that was one of my favourite shows, that and the Monopoly board show. Uh, that we did because yes. obviously our run sadly at the other palace has now come to an end uh, but we've had had such a fantastic time there uh, but the Monopoly board show was insane wasn't it it was crazy it was, so it was kind of like Jumanji the musical mm. where we're like at a games night people gathered together on a Saturday night to play Monopoly and then we ended up like uh, being sucked into the board and that you know changing our lives I think one of the reasons I love that show and I think we've talked about this before is because uh, when you have a good showstopper show you can really see the world, like even though we've got just a plain stage and, and a couple of chairs, you can really see every detail of the world that we've created. And I really believe that we were inside that Monopoly board. Ruth yeah. was the free parking attendant <laughs> and um, Justin was this really crazy, the Scotty dog, but he was like a really evil Scotty dog. And I was the banker and I really believe that we were those characters. One more message here oh, on yeah. social media. This is from uh, Laura. She says, uh, listening to your second podcast, uh, I'm reminded of an interview I heard with Lin-Manuel Miranda talking about Mary Poppins. Um, so this is our second uh, episode with uh, Obioma Ugola from Hamilton. Uh, and uh, she says here, I uh, heard Linwell Memoranda talking about Mary Poppins. He said that a spoonful of sugar inspired King George's line, Oceans Rise, Empires Fall, because he enjoys the fact that the music goes up on the word down in the medicine goes down. So he'd use the same trick uh, for rise and fall. Say that again. So in, so in a spoonful of sugar, yeah. I have the medicine mm -hmm. go down. down. So the music goes oh. up on the word down. Oh. And so then he goes, oceans rise, empires fall. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that really cool? That is really amazing. And also amazing that he knows that's what made him do that. Yeah. Because I, that's the sort of thing I would do and then be like, I'm so clever. <laughs> but he knows what he's inspired Absolutely. by. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things I like the most about Hamilton is all of those like tiny little references and mm. li like, the attention to detail is incredible. There's a homage to the West Wing. Uh, the uh, the American uh, presidency uh, TV series. There's a line in The Room Where It Happens where he talks about uh, how the sausage gets made. And that's a joke in the West Wing, like in one of the episodes. Two things you never want to see how they're made, laws and sausages. And then so he, he quotes that in, uh, uh, in Hamilton. There's a you know, wow. line about how the sausage gets made. And then in Hillary Clinton's uh, recent book, What Happened, she quotes that line from Hamilton of talking about how the sausage gets made and how she loves that line in that song, The Room Where It Happens, uh, because she thinks it's such a good insight uh, into her experience of the political process. Wow. Isn't that mental? It's like it just comes full <laughs> circle from the West Wing to Hamilton to actual real political life. Do you know what? We should say who our wonderful other showstoppers in the podcast are. Yeah. So we've got Duncan Walsh Atkins, obviously, on the piano. Uh, one of our, our musical supervisor, I believe, is his official correct. And we've got title. Matthew Cavendish also joining us for the chat. And we record recorded this chat uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the Museum of Comedy in London. The wonderful Museum of Comedy, which you should come and visit because it's got an amazing collection of comedy knickknacks. So pop on down. But for now, listen to this. <laughs> Welcome our special guest, Kaiser Hamelung. Hi. Yay. yay, yay, yay. 
whoop, whoop. How are you today? I'm all right. I've, I've just realised when I got here, I haven't spoken for about 12 hours. So I might sound a bit husky, but I'm, I'm grand. Was that uh, an elective thing or you no I think I just I think I just decided to to spend my Sunday quiet and didn't speak to anyone so um and then I walked here and didn't speak to anyone either and now I'm gonna speak to you guys yay yes now you are here in the museum of comedy with me Pippa Evans me Pippa Evans me Pippa Evans, me, Pippa Evans. <laughs> great good work it's already going <laughs> so smoothly Pippa hey at least I didn't pour burning tea on our guests Hey, what? that happened before we started recording. Therefore, to listeners, it didn't happen at all. <laughs> okay, I've got a very wet sleeve, guys. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and also with us is Matt Cavendish Hello. of the show Stopper. Hello, lovely to lovely to be here, Pippa. And of course, Mr. Andrew Pugsley. Yes. Uh, hello, yes, I'm here as well. So your name is Kaiser Hammerlund, is that right? Kaiser Hammerlund. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a few things that normally I tell people because they get scared when they see it and, and you can see the panic in their faces if they read a list or auditions or anything, they look at it and they go, K -k 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 -k. yeah, that's me. And um, normally the Kaiser Chiefs have done wonders for my name. Oh, great, ah, yeah. Course. Kaiser Soze. Um, so if anyone just says something remotely sounding like that, that's fine. But yeah, it's, it's, it's spelled K-A-J-S-A. -A. When I got my first agent out of straight out of drama school, there were these formidable two older ladies in Wimbledon, their office was. And um, I came in for my first chat with them and they were like, so, Kaiser Hammerland, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> oh, and I, was, I was very scared of them because they were formidable and one of them smoked a cigar. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was, was very scared. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> she was like Joey's agent in, in Friends. <laughs> so, um, but they were like, so, well, People are not going to see you. They just think you're foreign and can't do it. So we've thought about this. How about Catherine Hamilton? <laughs> and I, I, I think they saw the look on my face. And I, I, I didn't, I'm not sure. She's, she sounds quite horsey, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and quite old. And when you were like 19 and a bit scared, you're like, well, I don't know. Maybe we should just try it out and see if people want to see me. <laughs> so like, well, uh, all right then. But let's let's change it. Because British people can't pronounce a J as an, as an I because it's pronounced Kaiser. So let's just change it, the J to an I. And that's kind of stuck. So now my stage name is K-A-I-S-A. -S but it's actually Kaiser with a J, not Kaiser with an I. Uh, and Matt, yes. um, you've worked with Kaiser before. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. Tell us that lovely story. That is an interesting story. <laughs> uh, when, when was, we worked on a job at the Union Theatre, the old Union, before yeah, it moved. The old smelly under the arches y yeah, Union. Yeah, mice up and above. Yeah. Um, and then... We did a run there for about four weeks, and then Kaiser got me my next job immediately after that, which was well. Yes, I, he didn't give me well. He didn't give me any commission for it, but yes, I no. did. I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, Awkward. I, yeah, yeah we, yeah, uh, I'm <laughs> still waiting. Um, <laughs> I found Matthew rather hilarious, and then I um, got sent the script for a Christmas show at the Park Theatre, um, which um, I was offered to do, and then I read it, and I was like, well, this part in it is perfect for Matt. So I told him and I told the director that they should hire him and they did. Quite and forcefully, he was yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. I can be very forceful. Yeah. <laughs> you pin the director right. up against the wall. Yeah. You must hire Matt Cavendish. Yeah. And he was hilarious. We ended up spending like the best part of four months probably together. I know. And now and we try to see each other as little as possible. Yeah. 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 It was intense. It's Cage. quite easy to burn out over a long show with uh, <laughs> your castmates. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So now we just save it for whenever someone's in a show. So, so Matt, the big question is, what, what have you ever done for Kaiser? It seems like this seems a I pretty one-sided really relationship. Uh, I mean, yeah. Do you, go, oh. you, you got me here today, right? I got you in is this today. It? Is this, this, is right. this is me Back repaying in a damp you. Arch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is me repaying you. And what, and what was the show? The Boys from Syracuse. Yes. Oh, One of the classic. first Shakespearean adaptations into a musical with Rogers and Hart, music by Rogers and Hart. We wore togas. We did ill-fitting togas. <laughs> Matthew looked very fetching in I his. I did not. <laughs> uh. No, we had a great time. Um, I'm not sure if it was the best of musicals, um, but we had a great time and we laughed a lot <laughs> and we made some lifelong friends from it. So great great. I, I, lo I, say, I love a bit of Rogers and Hart. Something uh, in Showstopper it hardly ever gets suggested. I'm going to challenge myself. I don't think I'd be able to sing a song that was definitely a Rogers and Hart versus a Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh, they're, they're completely different. We'll take Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island too. That's a Rogers and Hart classic. I wish I was in love again. Da, da, da. So it's slightly more Cole Portery. Yeah, way, way more. It's like it's like 20s 
kind of Cole Porter, Golden Age kind of music. And then with Rodgers and Hammerstein, then they completely reinvented the form and did very different things with the music. Do you think they were ever like jealous of each other? Do you think there was like... Hart and yeah. Hammerstein. Yeah, Hart and Hammerstein. I may be wrong, but I think didn't Hart end quite tragically? Oh, I'm no. not sure. Sometime oh, no. talked about it a little bit in the book Finishing the Hat, uh, if yes. you've read it. There's mm-hmm. some very information good that mm-hmm. I cannot recall. But, <laughs> 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 but, 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 but I remember he talks about Hart uh, at some point. So <laughs> that, That's great facts, Matt. Great Why facts. do we need Wikipedia when we have Matt Cavendish? <laughs> great story. I remember girl. there is a fact out there. <laughs> Just don't somewhere. know what it is. Yep. Uh, that's amazing. So, uh, so you maybe have a bit of a connection with Arches as you are currently in the, the Charing Cross Theatre, another Arch premises. I love an Arch. Uh, yes, I am. I'm currently playing Violet in Violet, the musical at Charing Cross Theatre. This is a musical that, that some listeners might not be very familiar with. It's a first time it's been done here um the uk premiere um it is a story based on a short story uh, called the ugliest pilgrim by doris letts um bets bets i think it's bets doris bets doris letts Qu- quentin letts no look. doris bets definitely not <laughs> quentin letts <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it tells us the the tale of violet who is a young girl um in north carolina from north carolina it's 1964 in america and when she was 13, she um, got an axe blade in her face. Uh, a big, horrible accident. Her dad was chopping wood. She got an axe blade in her face. She's got, she's severely disfigured. Um, and now when she's um, grown up, mum and dad are dead. And she is obsessed with this televangelist priest that she's seen on, tevi, um, on telly. And she, um, he heals people on telly. And she wants that, obviously. She dreams about becoming beautiful. She has an obsession with the the film stars of that era, so the, the Ingrid Bergmans and the Ava Gardners and and um, all those people. And she wants to travel to Tulsa, Oklahoma to get healed. So she saves money and she gets on a Greyhound bus and travels across America um, to get healed. And on that journey, she also meets a lot of people, amongst others, two soldiers um, that she befriends. And on the way... We learn things about ourselves and what beauty really is, you know. So yeah, it's 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 a glorious story, and it's kind of a traveling um, show. It's a hundred minutes straight through, and um, yeah, it's beautiful. I saw it um, with uh, Sutton Foster about four years ago on Broadway. That's the first time I saw it, and I didn't know anything about it. And I they had to pry me out of the toilets at the end because I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> the ushers were banging on the door because I had to close the theatre, and I loved it. And it, it was one of those. You know, when you dream about parts, especially as a woman in musical theatre, you know, you have a couple of these amazing parts that you dream of doing. And and that this was one of them. And when Tom Sutherland said they were doing it, I was thrilled. Um, and it's a bit of a dream come true, really. Yeah, fantastic. I saw you in it the other day and you were amazing, Thank may you. I say. When did you know it was happening? It all happened very quickly, actually, because I, I did... Uh, Fun Home, the musical, before this, which is also a Janine Tesori show. It's written by Janine Tesori and Brian Crawley. Um, Violet, this is. And um, and we actually did talk about Violet. And she said, well, I think someone has got the rights for it. Because I've been knocking on doors. Ever since I saw it on Broadway, I've been telling people and directors that I know. And like, why has no one done this? And they're like, well, someone has the rights. Uh, but we don't know. And, I, and um, so I've always wondered uh, who was going to be the first one to do it. And then all of a sudden... Tom came forward after he saw Fun Home and said, we have to work together. I've got something in mind. And I didn't think any more of it. I went, yeah, sure. And then he contacted me in November, straight after we finished Fun Home and said, we're doing Violet. Do you want to come in and sing for it? And I probably shouted a little bit too loudly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they, um, and I went in and I sang for him and then they phoned me the next day and said, it's yours. And apparently he'd thought about me ever since they got the rights for it, which is lovely. Um, but uh, it's also a co-production with a Japanese theatre company. So we had a Japanese director called Shintaro Fujita. And he, um, they're doing it in Japan. They, they've had the rights for a while. And they wanted to do a co-production with an English theatre. And they're doing it in Japan in 2020, translated to oh, Japanese. Wow. So I've got a year to learn Japanese. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Amazing. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it seems to be sort of Janine Tesori's moment in the UK oh, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously had Von Home, Caroline or Change, massive in the West End at the yeah. moment, uh, and now Violet. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's amazing that she's, she's thankfully finally kind of uh, gained some recognition over here. Yeah. 
She's Shrek amazing. We've been on tour as well. Let's not forget yeah, Shrek. Absolutely. Yeah. But, 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 I but love absolutely. Shrek. But let's I not do. forget Shrek. I think that yeah. is one of the most amazing yeah. things about this woman that, that she's she's such an incredible composer mm. and so chameleonic. Like it blows my mind that the same person mm-hmm. can yeah. write Shrek the musical mm-hmm. as can write Caroline or Jane. Mm, but this yeah. is exactly what I think as well. Chameleonic. This is a really good word for her because she is. She's a very. What's the opposite of vain? Unvain. She's not. She's not a vain composer. You can't. Within the first chords, often you can hear if it's a certain composer's, you know, yeah. work, you know. And but she is, she doesn't. She writes specifically for characters. She's very good at um, writing for the piece and for the for the journey and the arc of that character. And so that's why it's so varied. I think. And I don't know. Maybe it's because she's a woman and she's not that attached to her own um, kind of sound. But um, and she's wonderful. We worked with her for a week when we did Fun Home. She came over and wow. she's also an amazing director. Like she she. She did loads of exercises with us and, and helped us develop our characters loads in Fun Home. Um, when our director had to go back to America for a week, so we had her and Lisa Cron, who also wrote the book for Fun Home, for a week and working with them. And that that was magical. They were incredible, wow. incredible people. Um, and f- hopefully she's coming over to see Violet um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, she's been up for a big deadline, but she's coming over right. as well for the Olivier nominations, which we've got a few. So Hello. Congratulations. Yeah. And Fun Home, we should definitely talk about because Showstopper is a massive, massive fan of Fun Home. We saw the broader one. We also saw your one. And um, I think I think it might be the first time I've seen the two two productions of something and and actually loved them both equally because I was worried to see the, see, the, see the British version and be like, oh, but it wasn't the same as Broadway. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. I thought I thought you were fantastic. I thought the staging was incredible. That big, the reveal of the the house near the, in the third act is just shocking. But um, for me, that's like one of the most powerful pieces of theatre I've uh, ever seen. And actually, that and Caroline or Change, mm. to be honest, have been the two shows that have really blown me away in uh, sort of unable to speak to anyone afterwards mm. for yeah. a, for mm. amount of time. Mm. How was it to prepare for Fun Home? Uh, yeah, that was. I mean, that was huge. The thing is, I saw that on Broadway as well <clears throat> without really knowing anything about it. Um, and again, I was blown away and cried buckets. And then when I heard that the Young Vic were doing it, um, I, I was really excited. I've never seen myself being cast in Fun Home and I never thought that I could be any part in that. I thought, well, I'm probably in between ages and, you know, it's not really my my casting bracket. So I got so excited that I, as soon as they released tickets, I booked tickets to see it. Um, because <laughs> wow. yeah, because I got so excited, so I was like, because the Young Vic, they always sell out, especially them, you know, if they do musicals or anything. So I was, I was, you know, at nine a.m. Whatever, and I released the tickets. <laughs> I sat there and I was in a queue, and I managed to grab some tickets, and I was really excited. And I had friends who were up for it, and the casting process was really long. I think they did a, they cast the net very wide. They 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 saw people for for months, and um and I wasn't seen, and I didn't even think anything of it because I was like, well, no, they'll find someone. Great, I'm sure, and I can't wait to see it. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden I got a phone call from my agent and said, about, oh, yeah, they want to see you for, for Fun Home. And I wasn't really sure for which part. And I went, oh, right, okay. Yes, because I've only ever known you with very glamorous blonde hair. Exactly. Long blonde hair. Yeah, I've so, always been the small blonde one. Yeah, yeah. that's been my little <clears throat> casting bracket, you know, the, the wacky blonde best friend <laughs> or you know, whoever it is. But I, um, yeah, but I went in and I guess without any expectations because it, I didn't think that I would ever get it. So, but I learned the material and they sent you the material. And, and I had about three or four rounds, I think. And the American director came over and we did some tapes and sent over. And Julia Horan, the, the, the casting director, she was amazing. She was really, really on my side and worked with me and, and they knew what they wanted. And, and I think everyone who was up for that part knew that if they got it, they had to cut the hair off if they didn't have short hair already to look like Alison Bechtel. Um, and that was, it was, it was bonkers. W- when I got it, I was on a, on a crowded bus and my agent, um, rang me, um, and I, I started crying on the bus and, <laughs> and it, this lady asked me if I was okay. And I went, I'm just happy. They're just happy tears. And, um, it was one of those dream jobs as well to get because it was a long process and I didn't actually believe that I would get it. Mm. Um, and I was absolutely thrilled. And then obviously we worked with the, the American, the original creative team, um, we had about six weeks rehearsals. It was a long rehearsal process. Oh, yeah. And and yeah, in the middle of it, I I cut all my blonde hair off and dyed it brown. Wow. Yeah. And how was it having seen the original then for you to create your own version of the character? They were great. I mean, I think a lot of performers here are a bit scared when they do American shows or, you know, takeovers and big shows that have been elsewhere because you, you're scared that you're going to get just told to stand on a number mm. and, and do your thing. But they were very, very lovely. 
and we got a lot of freedom to do what we wanted and create our own, um, you know, characters and, and, and do what we wanted to do. But I mean, obviously I, because my character was based on a real person. I did loads of research. Alison Bechtel, I've read all her books, obviously, and um, I've seen loads of talks on YouTube and studied her. And there's a lot of information about her out there. So I tried to kind of delve into her instead of just the story. So that was my little thing. And listen to um, her accents, very particular. It was she was born in Pennsylvania, and that's quite a particular accent. Um, but then she's lived in New York for a long time. So I try to emulate that. How do you find doing accents, given like you're bilingual, like this is not your first. But I'm an immigrant in, in it. Yeah, I know. Well, you just <laughs> quite doing everything. So is it doubly difficult? I suppose is what I'm yes. trying to get. Yes, I was born in Sweden. Yeah. I am now the um, you know hashtag proud immigrant, and 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 I have two two passports now. I'm British too. I took the test a couple of years ago, and now I've got two passports. So I'm one of yous. Oh my gosh! What mm. was your favourite question? To become <laughs> British. Uh, what is the traditional thing to eat at Christmas? <laughs> wow, wow! That question. What in is it? Britain. <laughs> uh, I do remember one of them was chicken korma, um, <laughs> something about jam sandwiches, and then it was turkey. And I, mm. I think I got it right. Well done. Jam sandwiches, really? right? We, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. we had a steak this year in our family. We oh. had we had steak. We had like a weird 1970s dinner. We had a prawn cocktail <laughs> to start, <laughs> and then steak because we find turkey a bit boring. We never have turkey. We're, we're super posh. We have a goose. Oh. Oh, that, is, that is the proper. I know the question on the test wasn't yeah. what Pepper Evans and Matt Cavendish. <laughs> I know, or like to duck in. Yeah. Oh. And so to Matt's point, uh, were you were raised bilingual? Uh, um, no, 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 no. Um, my family is still. They're all in Sweden. They're tremendously Swedish. But um, we used to come over here quite a lot to see theatre. You know, once a year. That um, a lot of Swedes do. I think go to London for a weekend and and see some shows and do some shopping and all that stuff. Um, so I've been here quite a lot, and I've always loved theatre. So we've gone to the theatre a lot, but. We also start the educational system in Sweden. You know, you start learning English when you're six or seven, that, you know, your second language, and then you start your third language when, a couple of years later. And, you know, I think a lot of Swedes speak, speak good English in it. Uh, but um, I think also when I got here, I came, I came over to go to Mount View. I did a postgrad at Mount View. Um, I worked hard, you know. I hung out with the natives and, and I did lots of um, just emulating. I think it's... I think it's that. And when, when it comes to your question, Matthew, about accents, you just do a lot of work. You, you you just try to sound like the people you want to sound like. And then hopefully you do. <laughs> YouTube is great. What What's the tradition of musical theatre in Sweden? Is, is the, Does it exist? Well, you played Elle Woods in Sweden. I did. Yeah. I did this. The, I played Elle Woods in Legally Blonde, the Scandinavian premiere of Legally Blonde. Actually. In in Swedish. Mm. In Swedish. Oh my gosh! But Could you give us yeah, one of the yeah. lines, please? Those, oh my god! Actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, it is actually we we kept oh my god because you just can't translate that phrase and everyone mm. knows about we you know sure. we have all those college films and the American movies in, in Sweden as well so everyone knew about it. Um, um, Kan det vara sant det som jag ser? Nu vet jag inte vad som sker. That was <laughs> <laughs> um, so great. And, and would you do an American accent? No, you don't. You know? the, the, no, well, but we have the equivalent of of the Valley Girl. You know. Okay, sure, the sure. You know the Swedish, you know, dumb blonde. We have that accent in Swedish as well. So you do that, and people understand it. No, oh, that's really kind of fascinating. Isn't it? Yeah. What, what do you translate and what do you not translate? But we have lo- we have loads of musical theatre. Musical theatre is huge, but obviously. It's a smaller country, so not as much as here. Um, but um, no, Swedes love musical theatre. As I said, they they travel a lot to both Broadway and the West End to see stuff. You hear Swedish all the time around the theatres in London. And uh, yeah, we have a lot. And and is there much of a tradition of uh, original Swedish language musical theatre? Well, we, I mean, the biggest one is probably the Benin Bjorn one, yeah, the Christina, course, yeah. Christina from Duvamola, yeah. which is the biggest Swedish hit, I think, um, in Sweden. Um, and has that, has that had an English translation as well? Mm, I think, I think. They did, yeah. yeah. I think they did some concert versions of it in yeah. Amer- America and here at the Royal Albert Hall as well. But um, not ones that have travelled outside of Sweden, no. But yeah, we love musical theatre. That's what I was going to ask you, because mm. I didn't get to see it, but how was Sweet Charity? Mm. Mm. Oh my goodness, I loved it. Yeah. Uh, that's another it's, it's, dream come true, actually, because yeah. I was a, I was a bit obsessed with Sweet Charity. That's I saw the Shirley MacLaine film yeah. over and over again um, when I was a kid. So I loved it, but um, yeah, and it, my first time at the Royal Exchange and working in Manchester, 
which was beautiful. It was in the round, so that was really exciting. That module is crazy. If you haven't mm -hmm. been to the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester, you have to go because it's this only in the 70s, I think, would you have been allowed to do this? Like if you, if someone said today that, you know, this old lovely building, the Royal Exchange, let's just put a really futuristic weird module in the <laughs> middle of it and, made it, and make it a modern theater inside it. That would never happen today, I think. It was a wacky 70s idea. And it's it's so beautiful. And and the audience is so close to you because they are, it's, you know, in the round, they have six doors or five doors, which is very confusing because during tech we had, big numbers on all the doors and then for the first preview they took them all off and I I remember one time I was running around the module crying because I couldn't find the right door to get back <laughs> in so it was very confusing but it's beautiful and I love being in Manchester and the, the show was great I mean it's again it's a mammoth of a part and yeah. you're, you're never off and it's just it's beautiful that music is gorgeous so yeah, yeah. I loved it now that was a really big dream part. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions we love to ask people is, what's the part you would love to play, even if it's mm. a part you know that you would never be allowed mm. to be cast at? Mm, okay. I mean, I wish I could dance well enough to do Cats. I don't necessarily want to do it, but like to play <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mistopheles and Cats, just be, be knowing knowing that you that you can, that you're good enough to do that. That would be amazing. <laughs> Or like Mr. the white Mr. cat. Please is not what I would have picked out. <laughs> that is incredible. All three of us have been yeah. quite surprised yeah. at that. I didn't say That's it was great. a dream. Having, I didn't yeah. say it was a dream oh, okay, part, okay. but it's, it's one yeah. of those things. Like, imagine being that good at dancing that you know that you could do Mr. Mistopheles. Oh, I see. So it's more like I wish to be able to do it rather yeah. than right. I would then, yeah, what yeah. I want is to be able to turn down <laughs> Mr. Mistopheles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Someone to say you could do that because yeah. you're such a good no, dancer. I probably have a similar feeling about Starlight Express. I don't think I'd ever actually want to be in it. I wish I had the skills to be in it. You can I just wish be I jealous could. of the skills of those yeah. people who can actually do it. We, we talked about that last time, didn't we? How many accidents were there on Starlight Express? We still haven't Googled it. Speaking of which, uh, yes. Showstopper podcast book recommendation. Uh, oh. all, all of the Showstopper cast have been reading uh, A Song of Spider-Man. Yes. Month, which is an amazing book by Glenn Berger, all about uh, the the process of putting on the Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark musical. Mm. And it's the best book I've uh, I've read uh, about, uh, uh, yeah, about show business generally recently. It's just an amazing story, incredibly well written. And really weird to read this story, which is about... Um, million million pound dollar sorry uh, production mm. yet within it to see familiarity with everyone's own experiences from fringe theater upwards just the yeah. same cr creatives knocking knocking heads and uh, locking horns people having visions and they haven't really thought about wh why they've got that vision or who this show is really for it is absolutely brilliant and also i got about 10 pages in and went how how are, how is he ever going to sustain this book because it's already absolutely horrific <laughs> <laughs> and by the time you get to the end you you literally have to you have a sigh of relief i almost cried when i finished that book but when they finally got the show to open i wish i'd wow. seen the show i had several yes. friends yeah. who saw the show but it was one of those car crash shows that people went to see just because they had mm, to right yeah and they lost how many millions? I don't know. I can't remember how many. But actually, mm. if you watch um, any of the clips online, it looks like it was actually probably quite a good show. Yeah. But the problem is the story of the show was much bigger than the show was ever going to yeah. be. So you're going for the car crash. And even if the car crash isn't actually a car crash, you've kind of already told yourself uh -huh. yeah. you want to see the car crash. I love the vision he has of the he sees a small boy crying before the interval of the first act. Yeah. Um, and he's, he realizes that maybe they haven't quite made the show for the person that the show was for. <laughs> and the mum's saying something like, it's all right, darling, Spider-Man will be okay. <laughs> it's written by the guy who wrote the script, right? The book yeah, is written that's by right. the guy yes. who wrote the Glenn script. Glenn who wrote <clears> the, <throat> who sort of, again, was sort of plucked out of relative obscurity and managed to, to land this absolute dream job. Uh, he being like a like a comics uh, enthusiast, ah, uh, okay. loving YouTube, being absolute uh, uh, in adoration of Julie Taymor, the director of the show. Mm. So like absolutely thought this is my moment. I finally like made it to the big time and it's an incredible job. And then he watched like bit <laughs> by bit each of his, <laughs> his dreams be unpicked and everything go sort of disastrously wrong. And the, and the great irony of all of this is the way uh, Broadway contracts work. You don't get paid until the show actually opens. So he's sort of, you know, like scrounging away, like oh desperately God. trying to make rent every month, working with millionaires. And like, and the show, because it was in so many troubles, just didn't open and just kept being in previews and previews and previews. And there he's like desperate, like for his, <laughs> to just to finish the job, get it open so he can have his paycheck and, you know, feed his children. It's like, but it's crazy in America, isn't it? Because they have so many producers and all these shows. I, I don't know if it's starting to become like, like this here as well, but, but 
but people, you hear these stories about the previews of a, of a new show and all the producers, there's so many of them that they're, you know, they're, they're lying up at the back of the stalls and you can just see them and, and they all want their input and it must be so difficult to work with, with all these people who just want their say and quite possibly they're not in theatre so they... They might yeah. not know what's well, anyone, best for the show. Anyone or the story. who invests is named as a producer, cooks, so yeah. they're just investors essentially. Mm. Yeah, with yeah. Uh, but you don't have a special name like associate producer. There's like a special name for producer that means no, darling. We just want your money, darling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You yeah. see them on the Tony Awards as well because yeah. they all have to come up on stage. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Two hundred of them on stage. You want to have all these rich people? white men getting on stage? <laughs> <laughs> Generally, yeah. yeah. That's what it is. But that, that's very heartening, though, to hear with, with Fun Home that there was the space for you guys to, to make your own No, we we it. was, yeah, we felt very well taken care of and they were lovely. And they also, I think they they relished the fact that they could do it again and, and do it afresh. They they wanted to do it slightly differently. And obviously our setup was different because it wasn't in the round like it was um, on Broadway. And this is actually, apparently, this is the way they always wanted to do it because they wanted the big reveal of the house at the end, oh, right. which they couldn't really do in the round because stuff came up and down yeah. on traps. Yeah, we loved it. We had a great time. Oh, so the songs in that, I, I just, I, that, the mm. song, that uh, Telephone Wire mm. song, it is mm. like, I can't listen to that song. And Days and Days, mm. just both of them break me every time I mm. hear them. They're so beautiful. Particularly that moment where grown up Alison gets into the car mm -hmm. and you realize, oh, she's reliving this moment. Oh, yeah. oh. I didn't get through that song once in rehearsals without breaking down and, and yeah. crying it, it was mm. it's such a touching piece for everyone even if you're not i don't know even if you haven't come out or even if you haven't had a father who's killed himself or or been a closeted homosexual i mean mm. all these things are really heavy stuff but it, the piece in itself is so beautiful and touching in so many ways that you can find something within that to that will touch you and it's a it's a story about you know um dreams and aspirations and and family dynamics and shame and all those things that that mm -hmm. we all have so it's really relatable and how do you look after yourself if it you know if it's going to affect you that much uh that's a lot to live through and then you've got a two show day where you have to live through that twice yeah. is there anything in terms of self-care that you, as an actor that you do it's really well <laughs> it's really interesting because it is people ask you a lot and obviously at some point it's just acting right you can't go daniel day lewis and live your character all day it's acting you have to let it go but you do get affected. And I that show in particular, the Fun Home, because I was so still and I had to be on stage mm -hmm. for the whole time, but I was very much an obs observant of, of everyone else on stage to start off with. And I got I got real tension issues in my neck. I had to go to physio a few oh, times because wow. I got, and I've never had that before. And I think it was just because she's so held and repressed. I think I kind of took that on board a little bit and I had to go to physio a few times and, 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 but I had to learn to, to, uh, you know, you do stuff then with your body, you have to do yoga and you have to do a specific warm up just to release all that tension and afterwards as well. And then now uh, to, as a contrast, I'm doing this show where I'm flinging myself about. Yeah. And again, I'm on stage the whole time, but I'm really moving about. And I'm more like me, I guess, in my movement pattern. And I haven't had any trouble, which you'd think, oh, wow, you'd yeah. think this would be the one where you get injured all the time, but I get, attention release from moving a lot so i think that's different but you do get affected um and even this violet is also quite emotionally loaded at the end of it you have to have a big kind of existential crisis and, and question yeah, I mean, yourself you, you and you're being quite emotionally loaded it packs a big emotional yeah. punch again isn't it it's hardly uh it's not a shrek the musical no okay. no it's, it's a shame because shrek is excellent i just like to repeat <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> do you want to, to, do you want to be in shrek Mike? i would love to be <laughs> shrek yeah. you Next should be the, the king guy shouldn't you yeah fuck you'd one be, thank you for amazing. those of you who don't know i am five foot five and so that is the perfect part yeah. If I for two, I'm going to fight you for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could. I was thinking more of your personality, that you have a horrible personality. Oh, yeah, yeah great. <laughs> Thanks, Pip-Pop. <laughs> Dug herself out of yeah. that one. Bitter and jealous. Yeah. I'm in a damp crypt. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? So, uh, have you ever done any improv? Not really. <laughs> no, apart from, I mean, horrendous lessons at drama school, which we all dreaded, where you have to go up and, you know, one by one, stand in front of the teacher and go, go on then, be funny. What? You know, the clowning, mm. the, the dreaded week where you do clowning yeah. at school um, and you have to do that. Yeah. So those are the, the kind of traumatic memories that I have of improv, really. Um, oh, great. Well, we're looking forward so to I bringing them back I can't wait up. for the improv section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely reignite all of those memories. <laughs> Be funny now. Mm. Yeah. Well, I suppose from our point of view, weirdly, because it's a comedy improv musical, is the remit. But we really 
um, work hard on not trying to be funny because yeah. the worst thing ever is watching someone trying to be funny. And we all know in the show when we're trying to be funny because we're suddenly really not very funny. <laughs> uh, so that's that's very interesting question. And I saw you, yeah, I saw a, a, a short, I went to the... Um, the um, launch of the Edinburgh Fringe last year. You did a little section there. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Was that I Kissing s- With Tongues? I no. saw that. No, 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 no. no. That, was not, that was a different launch party. Uh-huh. Uh, very pip- different. Pip- <laughs> cut that bit, cut that bit. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, I, th- I think we should tell the story of Kissing With Tongues. Kissing With Tongues. Uh, what? <laughs> sure, but, the musical. I'll try and tell it. And then, because it, it, Edinburgh always ends up in a big haze, even though Showstopper, I have to say, as a, as a company, we're pretty... Chase, don't we? Like, we're not, hardly we're anyone. Boring. Drink, boring. Yeah. We're pretty boring in terms of wildness. So we're at this oh, yeah. party. Uh, the, what was it? Some party? I the think, Fringe I magazine? I think it was the List magazine. The List launch magazine party. Ah. launch party. And they'd asked us to do a 10 minute section or a 20 minute section. And it was just me, me, Andrew, Justin, and um, Duncan on keys. And so we and we had to do a sound check. So we started doing the sound check uh, and we sang this song that just went, Kissing with tongues, <laughs> kissing with tongues. Kissing with tongues. And we but and we enjoyed it like far more than is at all rational. Like yeah, we were yeah. like we really enjoyed it too much. We were just in some kind of silly mind. And then uh, they asked us to do another song, and so we just ended up singing "Kissing with Tongues," but just in a different musical genre. Yeah. And then we just did like a good, like you know, fifteen-minute sound check, just singing different versions of the song "Kissing with, with tongues. tongues." And then occasionally we do like a verse uh, that was as far away from "Kissing with Tongues" as possible. It was about being on a train, and then people would sing. But the best thing to do on a train is a "Kissing with, with Tongues." tongues. And uh, it, it was all very amusing to us. But then we, at the end of it, we realized this poor sound guy who had no idea what our show was. I'm like, yeah, the. Show Showstoppers, they just, they do kissing with tongues. It's their <laughs> weird kissing comedy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> their no. theme song is kissing with tongues. Uh, so that was my memory of Edinburgh. Ooh. But that probably was a different show to Yeah, no, I did, I did see it and, and, and I was at the front and laughed and clapped loudly. So, yeah, okay. I was lovely. I'm, I'm in awe of you guys, whatever you do. And, um, yeah, in awe and scared. A bit like Mr. Mistopheles, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I had an idea, which was uh, like the play translations. <laughs> just that's a, I don't need to do that lofty uh, introduction. <laughs> it's just uh, Kaiser can improvise and sing in Swedish, and then Andrew can translate uh, what she's saying well, in Andrew, you, English. You obviously know Swedish. Yeah. Right? Oh, obviously, I'm, I'm completely fluent. fluent. So yeah. anything you want to throw at me, mm-hmm. uh, let's be uh, great for us. Take it away. What's the, what's the style, Matthew? Uh, Pippa. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's oh the style. I think. Um, I like, well, let's go kind of like a modern... Oh, Jason Robert Brown. Jason Robert Brown. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay. Du satt där och tittat på mig It's a long, dark night Varför tog du grisen ifrån mig? I'm underneath the moonlight Nu skinner månen på oss I'm waiting for the morning to come När kommer du och hämtar mig? And you come and make my day. För en gång skull kan du tala sanning till mig. I'm taller than you might Varför? think. Varför? Varför ser du inte på mig? Jag ser i mig. So Varför? Varför har du inte tagit kritorna med dig? Hello to you. Tommy Handen. Tommy. So go. You're my best friend. Tommy Handen. So go. We move the sun. Tommy, what would I do without you? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Do you feel that with me? Do you feel the same way too? Yo, yo, dear. Yo, yo, dear. Yo, 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 I'm in the house. Your and smirkles till me. Your sparkles light the night. (laughs) (laughs) That was me. That that one was make me a sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. That's great. (laughs) I don't even want to know exactly yeah. what you said. 
because the translation was too good. There was there was crayons in there. There was all yeah. Mm. Mm. Great, great, yeah. beautiful. Mm. Well, that was a great chat, wasn't it? Isn't she amazing? Yeah, really. What a really great uh, collection of jobs. Kind of like you were saying, the chameleon that is Janine Tesori. Thank you. Uh, that's such a great word. It's like the difference between a chameleon and and the the word broad, isn't it? Uh, it's just like a. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? There yeah, is a difference yeah. between those two things. Like yeah. a really brilliant collection. Yeah, and I see what you mean. Kaiser exactly like that. She can be, you know, Mamma Mia. Then she can be in Sweet Charity, yeah. and then she can be in Fun Home, and you know, uh, uh, then Legally Blonde. Yeah, it's incredible. She's the chameleon's chameleon. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you should go and see her at Violet. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's on until uh, the sixth of April. Yes, at the Charing Cross Theatre in London. So get yourselves down there. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, why not have a little subscribe uh, on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and also leave us a review and a rating. That's right, a rating of five golden stars. Exactly. No more and no less than five (laughs) stars, please. Uh, And be sure to follow us on Twitter at the Showstoppers and on Instagram at Showstopper Musical. Or look at us on Facebook or look at our website, www.showstoppertheMusical.com. Or call us on 020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give Pippa a little, send Pippa an uh, unsolicited text. She'd I'm, be very happy to I'm lonely, guys. Her. I'm lonely. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Andrew, shall we go and make up a musical? Yeah, let's do that. Bye. Bye. Bye.